What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. A cliffhanger on America Trends, part two right. of the financial crisis. John Krofsick is still mulling the crisis. And uh, I'm Larry Rifkin. How are you today? We're back. <laughs> same bat time, same <laughs> bat channel. <laughs> Boy, people were on the edge of their seats, John, waiting for us to come back to talk about the financial crisis. What did you think we were going to come back and talk about? <laughs> we haven't gotten it out of our system yet 10 oh, years later. Well, like I, I said in the, uh, in the other one, I, I think... They say these things come around in like 10-year cycles, so I don't know. I'm no predictor of these things, but that's what they say. Well, that was a mighty big crash (laughs) that we heard back in 2008. So that doesn't come around every 10 years. Recessions do. Yes. But uh, that was systematic. I mean, we could have seen the whole thing go right in the drink. And it's interesting because sometimes... Well, I I think we're about ready to go into the drink because of our debt problems here in America. I've been worried about that for a very long time. And I think, John, I've told you the story and probably on radio, maybe even on one of the podcasts. But I was on a beach uh, front in an an area and I was talking to a truck driver. And this was in a wealthy community uh, on Long Island. Uh, But we started talking and he said, um, you know, remember what Mao said. Now, you don't hear too many truck drivers Quoting Mao Zedong. That, that's true. That's uh, that would make me uh, wake up fast there. I mean, they usually <laughs> will quote Johnny Cash or Burt Reynolds, but not Mao. So, at any rate, and he said to me, you know, we were talking about this crisis and all, and he said, you know, don't forget that sometimes nothing happens for decades. Ah, oh, yes. And then that sometimes decades years. happen overnight. Right. And that always stuck with me. And I said, you know, that's wisdom. Um, Mao Zedong, <laughs> that's <laughs> wisdom, because I still expect to wake up one day and read some horrific headlines about where America's headed financially. I really do. Oh, but I agree with you. I, I hope think, I'm wrong. I, I think this debt that we're, we're building up for the future is, we're gonna, somebody's going to have to pay it sooner or later, and, and it'd be nice if we got a handle on it sooner than later, but... Well, I think a lot of our recovery has been built on a bubble. I really do. And sometimes yeah. we do it on a housing bu- bubble. Sometimes we do it on an interest rate bubble where we kind of make money right. flow freely, whatever it may be. But we really mask some of the underlying problems that we have. But you asked the question before the most recent podcast that we did. And go back and listen to that, Ed Pinto. But on this particular podcast, John, we're going to get into the question that you put in front of us. And that is, why did nobody go to jail? Why, God, why? (laughs) Is there any justice? Uh, And you sort of wonder about this too big to fail. I mean, the government picking who's the winners and who's the losers. I mean, I I think... That, that was a bad president to take. President. Well, I remember back at that time when we had this argument, even on the air, which was, well, if we gave every American $100,000, right. wouldn't that stimulate the economy more than bailing out this company and this bank and forcing banks to take monies that they right. didn't even ask for? You recall all of yeah, that. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, wasn't it better perhaps to put the money in the pockets of the American people? That would have stimulated the economy, definitely. But I don't well, know. we have attorney John Delaportis with us, and he's got a lot to say about how the bankers made billions from the 2008 financial crisis and how they could do it again. Oh Well, I, I think they still are. They bank the money. They're making the interest on it, and they're not really giving out as much as they used to in, you know, the 80s. <laughs> well, we're going to try to delve into some of the things that uh, might have confused all of us at that time about credit default swaps and all this stuff that uh, was part of the vernacular then. But don't forget it. I mean, don't let it slip past you because it could come again. America <laughs> loves to 
uh, do things to excess and not necessarily in the most uh, genteel way. We're a very aggressive society and we have a lot of risk takers and that redounds to our benefit, but also from time to time to our detriment. Absolutely, because if you take risks, you can make big gains, but you can also have big losses. And Absolutely. I still think nobody's too big to fail. Ah, I love that. <laughs> All right. Even that 400-pound guy on his bed who's uh, trying to corrupt the entire Internet. We've heard about him many times. Well, listen, we hope that you will listen to this. Go back, listen to Ed Pinto, now John Delaportis. And again, America Trends, going back so we can go forward in a better way and a more economically uh, secure manner going forward as we look at the financial crisis uh, that is just uh, 10 years on and uh, very important to go back and look at it again. On the line with us is John Delaportis, and he is co-chair of Kelly Dry's Securities Litigation and Enforcement Practice, and he aggressively defends clients in shareholder class actions and in civil enforcement actions and investigations brought by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So I just want to go back to the financial crisis of 2008 and uh, give us your take on really what went wrong there. Uh, It was around this time, September and October 2008, a cascading series of bank and business failures, one on top of another, led to what uh, Federal Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke described as the, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression in the 1930s. And essentially, we saw several uh, very esteemed financial institutions go under, most significantly Lehman Brothers Bank. We saw what was essentially a run on the entire money market fund industry, requiring a $4 trillion guarantee by the Treasury Department. And we saw uh, unprecedented bank and other business bailouts. Uh, in order, in the in the view of the uh, of our regulators and our elected officials, to stop the financial panic and to keep the country from plunging into an even greater recession, if not depression. We talked to another person because we're doing a two-parter on this. It's so important to look back and then to look at where we are today and perhaps going forward. And uh, I said to him, it seemed like it was a combination of reckless lending, Wall Street gluttony, blatant fraud, lax government oversight and deregulation that led to the catastrophe. Uh, Do you agree with that? And in what measure would you agree to those elements? elements being in the mix. Wow, I think that's a great list. <laughs> so, so I would say if I had to rank them, I would start with um, uh, excessive risk-taking and gluttony. I believe that was <laughs> one of yours. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say outright fraud would be number two. And I would say lax regulation, perhaps three. What were your other two? <laughs> uh, we Sorry. had uh, Wall Street gluttony. We had blatant fraud. We had lax government mm-hmm. oversight, deregulation, yeah. and reckless lending. I would say, I forgot about reckless lending. I would put that up there, and I would probably say... Uh, I'd put last the uh, deregulation. That probably had some some minor effect, but not as much as I think. The Glass Steagall Act and yeah, uh, commercial. I don't, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that repealing Glass Steagall was the the root cause. Although definitely, you know, it contributed. I will tell you that the other individual that we had on, Ed Pinto, looked at a lot of government policies as being a precursor to all of this and uh, encouraging these subprime loans. And uh, again, then the uh, financial institutions getting very creative about packaging these things and insuring against uh, various losses through these credit default swaps. Put yourself in the context of that debate. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Um, there was a, the, the problem with risk taking, and why I said it's excessive risk taking, is that we, as a capitalist society, we actually encourage risk taking, and we give great rewards for those who take risks with money. But on the converse side, we expect there to be a penalty, <laughs> which is if you if you engage in a lot of speculation and you do it poorly, you lose your money, and that's the way the system works. And so that's all in all a good thing. 
The problem with what happened leading up to the financial crisis is there was excessive speculation and risk taking with uh, w- with no penalty on the other side, and that was because number one, the there was always viewed uh, these entities were always viewed as as being subject to a government bailout, which is in fact exactly what happened. Number two, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as I'm sure your your prior caller mentioned, was insuring these these sub subprime mortgages. So there was again that was an implied government guarantee, even though those entities were were at, at that time privatized. And number three, even within the institutions. The the bonus structure is such that if you're a Wall Street banker or whatever, um, your bonus is at the end of the year. So there's an inherent incentive to pack off risks down two, three, four, five years down the line, by which point you get your bonuses. No Wall Street banker ever gave back a single penny of bonuses that they got, which caused the financial crisis. And no one, one went to jail bonus. either, right? Well, that's a very important thing because that's the other that's the other disincentive from reckless risk taking is the fear and, and outright fraud, which there was a lot of, which is no one went to jail. And I think we have to ask ourselves very hard questions as to why uh, none of the people who caused this at the senior levels of the banks and financial institutions were punished. The 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 prosecutors dragged in lots of little guys who made little mistakes in a bunch of show trials. But the folks who caused this all got away with it. And, um, you know, I think it's it's pretty clear why um, (laughs) we can talk about that. And by the way, put the insurance companies somewhere in the midst of this, like AIG, because they're only really supposed to issue policies to people who have a financial interest in a loss. And yet there were a lot of these credit default swaps that went on that basically, uh, it seems to me, uh, uh, really uh, went against uh, that particular aspect of their business. Explain what they are and how you know, this might have contributed to all that we're talking about. So this is something that I think a lot of people, including myself, did not realize was such a big part of the financial services industry prior to 2008. When we think of the insurance industry, we think of car insurance, health insurance, home insurance, and those are fairly well-regulated industries. Yeah, and we have the home to show, we have the car, and we have our body. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And we have uh, state insurance regulators who very closely look at these insurance companies and say, hey, do you have enough reserves on file that if a hurricane passes through or what have you, that you'll be able to pay claims? Now, the problem is AIG, who's a, a classic insurer, and, and I'd say overall the insurance industry did quite well in the financial crisis. This was a, a, something relatively unique to AIG. AIG, which was a well-known, long-standing insurance company, uh, uh, got into what's called these credit default swaps, where they were basically – they weren't insuring homes or cars or health care or things where actuaries can, can calculate the risk and set appropriate reserves. They were insuring multi-billion dollar financial transactions. Who would even think to insure such a thing? But they were doing it. They were not at all reserved sufficiently for it. They didn't, they didn't consider the possibility that with financial crises, uh, financial collapse happens in a cascading fashion, meaning one triggers the next, triggers the next, which is different from most insurable events, and as a result of which, uh, they found themselves very quickly unable to guarantee approximately $200 billion in insurable events, and the government, incredibly, wrongfully in my view, stepped in and guaranteed $200 billion uh, of insured events to a private insurer, AIG. Uh, And they did it because it was essentially a disguised bank bailout. AIG was insuring financial transactions principally to investment and commercial banks. Mm -hmm. And it was considered not not great politically to be directly bailing out banks, although a lot of that was done as well. And so there was a a backdoor bailout of banks 
through this bailout of AIG, this two hundred billion dollar bailout. But of AIG, originally, which has never really been discussed. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that you brought that up on our podcast. But when we go back and we look at how they were misled, or how they allowed to themselves to let their actuarial guard down, uh, was it because a lot of these tranches that were put together mixed some really good loans with some awful loans, and who was responsible for that? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question. So. Ordinarily, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have underwriting standards. So, so essentially, the, the, the more, more – well, let me backtrack. So normally you think a bank has a mortgage, and the bank checks out whether you can pay, and the bank has an incentive to do a good job checking out whether you can pay, because if you don't pay, you'll default, and the bank will be in financial trouble. That's kind of traditionally how the world of banking and home mortgages worked. At a certain point, Wall Street speculators, and this was well before 2008, this was back in the 1990s, realized that they could bundle these mortgages and securitize them, meaning the bank would give out 100 mortgages, would package them together as a single security, and then sell that, thereby passing on the risk to the security buyers. So the banks naturally lost their incentive to carefully apply underwriting standards. Now, on top of that, most mortgages are guaranteed by quasi-governmental institutions called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They, too, are supposed to have underwriting standards in exchange for the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac seal of approval. Yeah. That's why investors are, were willing to buy these securities. They fell down on the job, too. Now, why did they fall down on the job? People have different theories, but some of it was, I think, very good intentions policy objectives by, frankly, the Bush administration, which thought that home ownership was a universal good and essentially strong arm these agencies to loosen the requirements for home ownership. Well, we have an aversion today to integrity in almost any institution. They've all come under attack, uh, government, the church, uh, the banks, and, and so forth. In the case of the financial crisis, if you were to have a pecking order of those who let us down, uh, because we as individuals have no idea of the scope and the magnitude and the treachery that goes on here, who let us down the most? I would start with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I think it's the job of the regulators to assume that when mere mortals, bankers, are transacting with hundreds of millions of dollars and billion dollars at a time, that the incentive for corruption will, you know, corrode the finest men's souls. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the SEC really had an obligation to keep close tabs on what the financial security industry was doing. And they really fell down on the job. Um, just to cite one example, uh, Lehman Brothers was a 100-year-old investment bank. They were part of a program called the Consolidated Supervised Entity Program, whereby SEC uh, inspectors actually sat on the premises of the bank and reviewed their transactions. Uh, there, at the at the day uh, uh, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, September 15, 2008, the rating agencies, which you haven't mentioned, by the way, another whole group that failed, uh, had their bonds rated AAA. Lehman went from AAA to filing for bankruptcy. Really an amazing story. The SEC picked up on none of it. Afterwards, an examiner did a 500-page report. And he found that Lehman Brothers was ripe with fraud, that they were parking their liabilities overseas in f dummy shell companies in order to inflate their... And that was one of the payments. techniques that really brought a lot of this on, correct? Absolutely. Phony accounting. It's essentially fraud. And nobody from Lehman Brothers was ever prosecuted criminally. The SEC never even brought a civil enforcement action against anyone from, <laughs> from the SEC. From, from Lehman Brothers. Well, why did everyone get off? I mean, why is it that there's never been really anyone to, held to account, whether it's in the government and their inability to provide oversight or the individuals who ran these institutions? How was that even possible uh, when we think about the destruction that it did to the economy? And many aspects of that were still among us today. Well, unfortunately, and I'm speaking here only of the very top levels of our government, and this is a syndrome in both parties, so I'm not going to be part of it in any way. 
um, there's a bit of a revolving door. So, you know, among the among the the civil service, you know, my, my father was a government employee all his life, and I have a great respect for it. They're essentially hardworking folks, not making a lot of money, trying their best. However, at the top level, what you have is a revolving door, particularly with regard to the Department of Justice, which handles criminal enforcement of the securities laws, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, which handles civil enforcement. And basically, you have folks who go from uh, these high, high government positions, they spend a few years, then they go to large law firms where they represent all the people they're investigating. Then a few years later, they go back into government, <laughs> get, you know, uh, have oversight over these folks. And then a few years later, they go back to large firms or corporations, and they make tens of millions of dollars a year doing this. So just one example, uh, Eric Holder, if you want to ask why no one was criminally prosecuted, he was our uh, attorney general from 2009 to 2012, I believe, 2013, he would have been the person to prosecute everybody. He prosecuted nobody. After he left, he went to the law firm of Covington and Burling, where he's making enormous sums of money. And now he's back and apparently going to run for president. Oh, that's what we're hearing. I know. I, this is unbelievable for, for so many people in both parties. It's absolutely disgraceful. When you think about it, all the things that we attempted after this, uh, whether it was the Dodd-Frank Act or TARP in terms of the capital purchase program of the banks. I mean, what worked and what didn't? What has been built up and then torn down in the process that perhaps we've looked away and don't even realize? So I'm not sure that anything worked. I think the, you know, the, the, the fundamental, uh, the, the, economy, the, American economy, the American economy is fundamentally sound. So naturally, it should go up. What happens is if there's a little, if there's over exuberance and bubbles uh, build, then they will eventually burst, and they're very difficult to predict. So I don't know that we have done anything since 2008 which changes the fundamental dynamics of what caused the 2008 financial crisis. I think we've had, you know, 10 relatively good years. Um, as far as being um, uh, financial crisis free, um, and I think that's just a matter of of good luck. I don't know that uh, you know Dodd Frank did uh, expanded regulation somewhat, but I don't know that that made any material difference. I think that you have to understand that the financial institutions and Wall Street are always going to be ahead of the regulators. It's just the nature of it. Laws and regulations take years to pass. They always deal with the, the past crisis. They never deal with the next crisis. So, you know, from my standpoint, I think we should really try to brace ourselves as an economy that we will have these crises from time to time. The, the things that we could have done differently, which we didn't do, was number one, put the perpetrators in jail. That would have been a great thing to do. Uh, and number two, um, we, could have, we could have thought up some mechanism whereby people like Bob Rubin, who made $120 million uh, leading Citigroup and then left and left a humongous multi-billion dollar bill for the, the taxpayers, some sort of mechanism where if you collect bonuses and then it turns out uh, uh, you were just delaying the risk down the line for somebody for somebody else or for the taxpayers that the, the taxpayers can somehow recoup that money. And I'm not sure what the mechanism for that is, but since it's never been even discussed or seriously contemplated, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know that that's. Well, that's I remember at the time there were people who said instead of bailing out the banks, refinance mortgages on Moss, even though the fact that the government underwrote a lot and uh, made a lot of the requirements uh, as loose as they were, that was a contributor to all of this. But policymakers were more interested at the time, seemingly, at bailing out the banks. Uh, and that seemed to have an effect on the public saying, why are these guys getting a deal and I'm being shorted in this process? And I'm reading that since uh, early 2007, the net worth of the typical household has gone down by about 20 percent. Even though I know we read about a roaring stock market, that's limited in terms of the number of people who participate. So what do you think about that? I mean, should we have gone about the process of repair and looked at the individual rather than some of these institutions? 
Well, yeah, I saw an interview with Warren Buffett right after it happened, and, I, and he's a pretty smart guy. And he said basically the American economy is like a jogger who's having a heart attack, and we're sitting around debating whether or not to give him electroshocks or CPR or what have you. <laughs> and so I think the, the, the thinking from the policymakers was – you know, this is clearly bad policy to bail out the banks, but we've created a disaster and we have to resuscitate the American economy. And then we'll figure out what we did wrong and how to fix it later after the crisis has passed. So I do think that the policymakers were grappling in the immediate short term future with an economy careening towards collapse and felt the need to do something quickly. With the benefit of hindsight, I don't think it was the right approach. I do think that we have a system to bail out uh, depositors. We have depository insurance. And so if you have up to, I think it's currently 200,000, 250,000. I um, would not have that number at the top of my head, yeah. (laughs) I think it's 250,000. It was, I think, at the time, 150, and now mm-hmm. it's 250. If, in an FDIC-insured bank, you'll get your money back, even if the bank collapses. I'm not sure what the policy justification was for bailing out the, ba- the shareholders of the bank, which is what we did. I do think that if you invest in any other kind of entity and it goes bankrupt, uh, you as a shareholder are going to lose your investment, and that we consider proper. That's the way the capitalism works. But for some reason, the shareholders of these large banks were bailed out, and they are predominantly not ordinary folks. They are predominantly people on the, the, the well-to-do end of the spectrum. And so I, I can completely appreciate that uh, you know, what was viewed is not something that was viewed as necessarily equitable or just. Do you think that another collapse uh, is p- possible in the near term? Do you think that we have corrected a lot of these wrongs? Is the banking institution today uh, in America, the whole system, stronger? Uh, are federal policies related to housing any better? Um, so I'd say that's a mixed bag. Uh, for, first, with regard to the banking industry, I think it's probably worse. And the reason is because with the collapse, there was a lot of further consolidation in the bank industry. What you want with the banking industry is actually lots of little banks. So if a few collapse, your economy doesn't collapse with you. Unfortunately, we've gone in the opposite direction. We now have four big banks, which control probably 80% of the economy. And if one of them collapses, they are in in the, the famous words, too big to fail now. So that's a problem. I do think that reckless mortgage lending was tightened up. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have gotten much more stringent in um, who gets mortgages. Now, there's a downside to that, which is that home ownership has, has gone down again. But I do think that that aspect, the, the, the excessive securitization of subprime mortgage loans, that particular issue, uh, I think, has been cured. But I think kind of the the other four things you mentioned, uh, fraud, <laughs> gluttony, <laughs> lax regulation. Still there. I don't think any of those were improved at all. No. I think if they're, they're the same or worse. Perhaps uh, the greatest downside of what happened then and how we handled it and who we bailed out and who we did not imprison is that the public seemingly has grown distrustful more so than ever before and we they see this pol- well we see this polarization we see these various movements from the tea party to a disdain for corporate america we see donald trump's rise which was certainly unexpected so maybe it's the political system that ultimately uh, bears the greatest scars from the financial disaster I would say that there is a great deal of distrust in our financial institutions, and it's a phenomenon that extends even beyond the 2008 financial crisis. You talk about household wealth. The average household wealth in America probably has not improved at all in the last 30 years, the median household wealth. The overall wealth of the country has gone up dramatically which means that all of the improvement over the last 30 years has gone to just folks at the top. Uh, Meanwhile, large swaths of the country are facing 
deindustrialization, opioid problems, all manner of social ills. And that's a problem that I don't know that anyone has come up with a, a great solution for. And I think what we're seeing in politics is a lot of anger. If we were to have this conversation three to five to ten years down the road, do you think we will have been hit by one of these bad bumps, if you will, in terms of uh, the last 10 years being rather quiescent. What do you think the next 10 might look like? I don't mean to be morbid, but we tend to get these crises about once every 10 years. You know, around 2000, 2001, there was the tech, the tech bubble burst. Before that, there was the savings and loan collapses. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's realistic to think that we will be able to survive another 10 years without some major financial crisis. So I think that uh, from the standpoint of, of the economy, um, rather than trying to predict it, since it's almost impossible and since Wall Street folks seem to be always one to two steps ahead of the regulators, we should just try to put a system of incentives in place where people who do wrong are punished for it, both criminally and financially. John Delaportis, I can't thank you enough for coming by today. He is the co-chair of Kelly Drive Securities Litigation and Enforcement Practice. Thanks again for being part of America Trends and a very important contribution to our discussion about the 2008 financial crisis and where we are today. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.